Prepare for the extraction point. We've been briefed on all the important stories and events in the world of emerging information. Now, it's time to extract the data and turn it into action. Live from the SiliconANGLE studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, this is Extraction Point with John Furrier. Today on Extraction Point from SiliconANGLE TV, Google reveals one pass for publishers, Twitter's secret video to advertisers leak, Android report, what we need to know about mobile app developments. And today, in studio, smart node and author Andy Kessler talking about his new book, Eat People, today on Extraction Point with John Furrier. Good. So, uh, Eat People, Andy Kessler, you just wrote a book, just came out, Grumby, your other book, which had great reviews on Amazon. I think I wrote one of them. Uh, that was a fictional story based upon non-fiction scenarios, right? Yeah. And Eat People is a non-fiction book, a bunch of rules for entrepreneurs to figure out how to find the next big thing. We're going to jump right into that detailed conversation about Eat People, the rules of entrepreneurship, identifying the next big trends, investing, participating in. But first, let's go down through the extraction points today. A lot of no, not a noise out there in Barcelona with Mobile World Congress, Google this, Facebook that, um, Google launching today the One Pass for Publishers. You're a publisher. You write books. You also write for the New York Times and Wall Street Journal, which they charge for content. So here's Google trying to one up Apple after they launched the uh, the App Store 30% commission. So uh, what's your take on that? I think it's great. I love when big companies battle it out for a share. I mean, look what Apple did. Is Apple's trying to run this closed ecosystem. You know, yeah, apps yeah. all have to go through them. They have to approve it. And now they're trying to do that with uh, with subscriptions, magazines, or, or iPad magazines, right? Where charge whatever you want, but we get thirty percent. And Google saying, "Hey, we're we're the open alternative. So uh, come and use it what you want. You want to charge what you want? That's fine. And, but we're going to make money doing search and other things rather than these subscription models. I, I think it's terrific. I mean, Google's been monetizing the web for effectively for uh, ten years now. AdWords and AdSense. I mean, they're not the most generous to publishers. I mean, you got you can make you know some lunch money if you have a, a blog or a website out there. If you're a big publication, then you got to do zillions of page views to make any kind of money. So, I mean, do I trust Google with that kind of power, or will they do it? Does it well, cannibalize uh, search? you know, they're, they're talking about uh, mobile devices, tablets, right? Because the argument is, is who gets magazines anymore? You've got to have these snappily dressed postal workers delivering them to a mailbox. They get wet, and they start smelling, and, and the like. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, we've got these nice, beautiful tablets. We're all going to have one soon. And so the battle is, how do I get... Newsweek or Time or Wired magazine, you know, yeah. delivered to those formats. And Google's just saying, we're going to be the more open alternative. We're going to have, yeah. we hope, more units out there. And so publishers come work with us instead of Apple. Apple's saying, yeah, but theirs are inferior. We have the nice, beautiful, and you're cool if you have an iPad. Yeah. You look just, you look cool. And it looks better, too. Yeah. Uh, well, That's what that they're saying. Apple says it looks better. The retina displays. <laughs> well, the extraction point there is, look, we talked about that yesterday. Apple's closed, and it does look good. The product's great. Android has got some serious graphics issues from platform to platform. They could have multiple different versions. So, I mean, I'm, I'm cautious. I'm, I'm with Apple on this one. Um, point two to talk about Twitter's secret video leaked to adver from, about advertising. Um, a video was out in the web uh, talking about... Uh, how Twitter works for advertising. So in essence, it's a how-to training video. And uh, basically, advertisers don't even know how to deal with Twitter. So I mean, yeah. you know, it's like- I mean, Paris Hilton leaked videos too, right? <laughs> and uh, I thought that was a how-to. Yeah, I mean, but the, look, the sex tape. I mean, about that's it. Twitter's we, sex tape. We just watched the Super Bowl, and these poor advertisers just spent millions of dollars just to run the ads, let alone the millions to develop them. And now, they're being told, forget all that. You have to get your message down to 140 characters, <laughs> right? I mean, who can get a message across 140 yeah, yeah. characters? But it's important because it, it's where buzz is created yeah. or it's captured. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I, I think it's quite fascinating. Uh, you know, Twitter still has yet to really yeah. figure out a business model to what they're doing. You know, uh, Google's business model, and as you said before, monetizing the web is really about capturing gross margin from yeah. retailers. And Twitter, they're going to get paid for that. I mean, even Facebook hasn't quite figured out how to get paid for page views on on friends sites. And so, yeah. leaking um, leaking tapes to advertisers is probably a good start. But boy, yeah. 
um, it's not the visual environment that advertisers like. My angle on this is it's pretty clear. It's just Twitter's so embryonic. They just like baby in diapers. They just don't know what they're doing. And same with Facebook. At least Facebook's over the top and says, hey, we don't know what we're doing. We don't really care. And we'll go dip into them. We've got zillions of users, so we'll make as much money as we can to break even. Twitter just seems to be forcing a business model, and they don't really need to. They have tons of money in the bank. Um, they're groping for an ad solution. This video really highlights you know, how really inferior Twitter's thinking is for monetization. So uh, I just think it, you know, advertisers don't know what to do, uh, mainly because there's really not much of a solution there. So you're saying it's spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. This is spaghetti against the wall. It's their sex tape. Uh, and I think they got a long way to go to figure that out. And I don't think, I don't think they should for I've said in my blog, Andy, I, I don't think they should force it. They got a great franchise. They're changing governments, freedom with Twitter and Facebook. I think they got such a huge number. Just run up the scale, make sure the system doesn't work, and let monetization play out. That's my that's my. I can't wait till we figure out what Philip Morris's hashtag is. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I haven't really regulated that yet. Uh, uh, the third, the third topic we're talking about extraction is the mobile market. And uh, Eric Schmidt was talking about Android activations. What was the number? Three hundred thousand a day. Three hundred thousand activations a day. How real that is? What countries they come from? We'll see. But I think the extraction point is Android's on a tear. There's a motivated group of people who want to deploy Android because Apple's going to block them out. And it's the classic. And it's free. <laughs> it's free, and it's an ecosystem of developers behind it. Um, and like we said yesterday, it puts the pressure on the Nokia Microsoft um, relationship, where Eric Schmidt said, "Hey, come work with us." So, well, Nokia was paid. I mean, there was a bidding war between Microsoft and Nokia. Excuse me, Microsoft and Google. Who could pay Nokia more to run their operating system? So, no longer do you not have to pay for an operating system. Someone will pay you to run it. That sort of smells of the days of uh, a dot-com world when people started paying for traffic and 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 paying for content and, until it got turned around uh, the mm -hmm. other way. And and um, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. I think um, I think Google is. A wonderful alternative to the closed system that uh, Apple is, and number one. Number two is, they're, instead of making phones, Google started out that way, but almost as a test case. They're owning a horizontal layer. That's one of the yeah. rules in my book, is, is just own a horizontal. And it's also a zero marginal cost business. It doesn't cost them anything except the development cost to give away copies of their operating system. And they make money either upstream or downstream from that. Well, in this case, before, we, before we jump into the, the rules about eat people, um, we'll try to hit some of the topics we just talked about, those three. Also, we'll, I want to add another extraction point is, and we talked about this uh, yesterday, was the bubble. This big bubble mania. Um, we'll talk about that. But uh, getting back to your book that's uh, out there right now called Eat People, and there was some reference on the blog screen about cannibalism. Or someone from the Washington Post mentioned it, but it's not cannibalism. You know, is not it, exactly. Is it a fork through a guy? I mean... You know, this is this book was inspired by what? Tell the folks out there why eat people. It's a lesson for entrepreneurs, lesson for investors. Well, what is the whole premise? What's going on is, you know, we're in an economy in transition. Of course, the economy is always in transition. But, you know, now more than ever, we're in the process of getting using technology to get rid of older, less productive, boring, mundane, garbage jobs and replacing them with high productive, high value, high margin jobs. And whenever we do that, you know, there's these sad stories, heart-wrenching stories of people that are being laid off and, and um, jobs that are lost. The unemployment rate is 9%. 26 million people are underemployed or unemployed. But the reality of it is it's all for the best. Uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, of all places, just announced no more toll takers. It's either going to be wireless fast track or they have a camera that takes a picture of your license plate and they'll send you a bill. Yeah, Get ticket. rid of all the people. That's what Eat People is about. Yeah, it's, it's automation. And you wrote a book also, End of Medicine. Um, we're here with Andy Kessler. I'm John Furrier and the Extraction Point. Andy, famous Morgan Stanley analyst. What was the, uh, one of the books said you were... Uh, what was your, your award you got? Top rated at, no. Uh, Institutional Investor of the Magazine. Year. That was the old thing that the the analysts would get ranked, yes. Yeah, of the year, some you know, historic you know, uh, super analyst. But that was early on the computer revolution when you were you know, young buck in the business with you know, Mary Meeker, but she came on after you. Frank Quattrone, you now worked Now I'm an with, old buck, is that what you you're know, trying to say? <laughs> no, you look good. You're an old buck. Um, but that was in the old days, right? And then you became a that hedge fund. the 80s, early 90s, yeah. Investor. Um, now you're an author. Right for Ran the a hedge fund maybe uh, less than a mile from right here, and we invested in small technology communications Internet, companies. Internet boom. 
right? It was, uh, you know, fortunately ahead of the internet boom. We didn't do dot com names, but every time, and this is answered your question about whether there's a bubble or not, every time money got thrown at these service companies, you know, like uh, gazuntite.com or eatmyshorts.com, we would put more money into the infrastructure companies of all yeah. the equipment that they had to buy. And that's an interesting way to play the money being thrown at the Zingas and Twitters and yeah, yeah. Groupons and Facebooks. You've seen your share of paradigm shifts and disruption and massive wealth creation through and and also you know carnage right so and destruction and now sure. you write about it for the times in the journal in your new book i mean what is the biggest theme that you see between when you were an analyst identifying the intels of the world and then pre-internet what were those some of those key patterns you saw then that you see now if do you see any yeah well you know it used to just be it used to just be in the corporate world, right? Is is you know PCs would change the way how corporations yeah. would operate and how white collar workers would uh, would manage their business. Now it's a consumer phenomenon. So you know in the in the eighties we had given up the consumer electronics business to the Japanese. I'll let them make the TVs and VCRs and DVD players. And now it's a very American phenomenon. The consumer electronics business is all about iPhones and iPads and tablets and each and the like. Even though HTC may make them, it's American technology. It's Google, it's, um, it's Microsoft software, it's Apple software. And so uh, the, the biggest change is just how fast these things are coming at is you. Is the mobile that's making it so consumer tech? I think mobility is one, but also just we're at the point where it's just so inexpensive, right? It used to be when I started on Wall Street, the big battle was, you know, digital equipment versus IBM. Now they're basically both, I mean, digital equipment is dead, and mm -hmm. IBM is now a consulting company that happens to make computers on the side. You know, th th those vertically oriented companies were destroyed by horizontal companies like Intel and Microsoft. Which and is everyone rule else. number what here on no, your rule number three, three rule number get three get horizontal <laughs> i had a roommate i used to come home uh late in the day He's horizontal and, uh, from too much uh too many too many cocktails you have a couple cocktails and say when in doubt get horizontal and i've always lived by that rule but what that means is instead of doing everything instead of yeah, doing yeah. soup to nuts you know just pick some horizontal layer some sliver of intellectual property that you can own do better than anyone else and then the pace of innovation above and below you yeah. like google doing an operating system great yeah. you own that maybe you own search below that but you're not making phones and you're not running you know stores like yeah, yeah. like apple is doing so you know i mean i see you've seen a lot of trends you've been involved in the business and you know you're really good writer you've written some clever books and entertaining books but this book seems to have two kind of themes to it one is lessons about identifying big trends and key key trends from an, either an investor or an entrepreneur job seeker but more importantly it's also got kind of a futuristic kind of bent to it eat people meaning you know we're living in a day of automation social interactions now online yeah kind of changing kind of society kind of some sociology well, issues involved, right? Yeah, is that a fair assessment? The Industrial Revolution ended, uh, I don't know, sometime in the 70s, and yeah. we entered this uh, you know, knowledge age or information yeah. age, and I think even that's dead, it's the idea age. You can just, you know, a couple of really clever coders in a, in a cafe up in San Francisco can change the world, can come up with the next neat app that everyone absolutely has to use, whether it's an Instagram that does, you know, photo manipulation and the like. And then recently we just had the guy from uh, Roku on yesterday who told us how they changed the world. Literally in a, a day and a half, they changed how they, you know, did their product so that guys can stream out of Egypt and boom, revolution, yeah. guys out of business, the out of the country yeah. and freedom. Change, change used to like that used to take two years of memos flying around at IBM or AT&T. Yeah. So, you know, look, uh, um, I was an electrical engineer. I was a programmer. Uh, I then worked on Wall Street for God knows too many years. And so I get email and I write books and op-eds. I get emails all the time from smart, young people that say, hey, I was an engineer. I was a programmer. You know, I want to either work on Wall Street or I want to be an entrepreneur. What should I do? Or here's my idea. <laughs> Run for the hills. Work. So I said, you know, I, 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 you can't type more than three sentences to someone back in an email. So literally I said, I, I think over my years, I've figured out a lot of things that yeah. are the criteria to how to find the next big thing. So I wrote it up. And so I wrote it for all those emails that I couldn't answer. And so it's a book for entrepreneurs. It's for investors because there's a lot of investment themes in it. And it's for job seekers. I mean, there's no reason that you can't be entrepreneurial inside of a big company. It's harder, but it's not impossible. But I, I, I want to tell anyone who's, you know, 20 something and looking for which company to work for, yeah. it makes a difference because yeah. you don't want to work for the next digital equipment or the next um, 
uh, uh, IBM that go, you know, is, is on their, there's their no, just no job security. Days. I mean, we've known each other. I've gotten to know you over the years and good friends. Um, so I think this is a great book for folks out there who want to get the insight from Andy, who's seen a lot of this movie before multiple times in multiple markets, multiple cycles up and down. Um, so let's break down the rules. Rule number one, uh, let's just go scale. This rule one, waste, abundance, horizontal, intelligence at the edge, productive, adaptive, eat people, markets, exceptionalism, market entrepreneur, zero marginal cost, virtual pipe, highest return. Okay, some good buzzwords. Let's break them down. Now you got to buy the book to see what that means. Scale. No, we're going to get them out of use. So scale. What's I'll, scale? I'll tell you the three no. that are the most important to me. And that's why I put them near the top. Okay, let's go the, through the ones the, you can share so people will no, buy I'll the share book. share them all, but I mean... Buy the book. The, 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 the ones that are... You know, AndyKessler.com for, uh, for, for uh, information on the book. When I look at investments or I look at uh, work with entrepreneurs, you know, the number one thing is scale, which is it's got to go down in cost over time. I mean, semiconductors have been able to do that since uh, integrated circuits were invented in 1958, um, uh, right? I was yeah. born in 1958, so they're as old as I am, and... and uh, you know, like me, they get cheaper every year. Um, the content business we're in get costs go up. The, the, our costs go up. Well, the we costs go up, but the cost per bit and everything else uh, <laughs> it has continued. So, 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 so communications since, uh, let's say, the late 90s, which is what drove the dot-com boom, the cost of communications has dropped. I think the cost of diagnostics because of silicon and the like is going to continue to drop. But look, there were businesses that used to scale. I mean, energy used to scale. Back in the days of Rockefeller, the price of oil, a barrel of oil fell from 25 bucks to 3 bucks, and it completely changed the world on how people would light their homes and heat their homes and, and the like. The cost of railroad ties and therefore transportation in the 1800s uh, changed. Those don't scale anymore. So don't be fooled by a business that used to scale, but I think you can find all sorts of things that scale. So that means that's one part of scale. And the other is don't do it. Don't do something for 10 people or 1,000 people. Do it for a million or 10 million. You put the same effort and the same cost into the intellectual property, but you might as well sell it to tens of millions. So consultants, there's tons yeah. of consultants out there. And what do they do? They have a client or a couple of clients. You want more clients? You got to hire more consultants. So, you know, we used to say about the consulting business, you know, none of the upside and all the downside. This is the old Wall Street line for consulting firms. And it's true, as opposed to writing a clever piece of code, you know, creating a dashboard or an API and sending it out there, selling it to millions or yeah. for use by millions. That's scale. Something's got, if you can bring the cost down 30% a year, you're going to have a business that doubles every couple of years. And that's a mighty tailwind to be uh, pushing you to heights. Eat People's name of the book, Andy Kessler, rule, big rule scale. Andy Kessler, Eat People's name of the book, was the second most popular. Yeah, the second one is horizontal. We talked about that. Is find that, that sliver of uh, intellectual property. I, I, um, I tell the story in the book of being on a plane uh, with a guy who had a company that, that – um, could put a, a charge plus positive, I think it was a negative charge or a positive charge onto um, different substances. And so, you know, they put this charge onto um, sunscreen, SPF, right? And, and, and the idea was you'd put it in soap and every morning you took a shower and you soaped up and you were SPF'd for the day. And the charge, would, you know, your skin is negatively charged, this is positively charged and it would stick to you for about a day and then fall off instead of that creamy gook that you put on with, with sunscreen. And so I said, oh, this is great. You know, you're going to license this to, you know, Ivory Soap and Dove and Irish Spring and whatever the heck. All the soap companies, I goes, oh, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to make it soap ourselves. And I go, what, what, what do you mean you're going to make it yourself? You're going to fight for shelf space and all the distribution hassles that go with soap. And um, I said, you know, just, you ought to, I was thinking to myself, because I uh, uh, didn't, didn't want to tell someone I thought their business plan was, <laughs> was stupid. But you know, just go horizontal. Just be a licensor of the technology. Let someone else deal with all the hassles. Yeah. He of gets to the market faster, in. lowers cost, no, no investment, all the sunk above. cost investment. Since the book's come out, I've heard from him, and he said, well, turns out that they have changed their business model over the last couple of years, and, and they're not doing it for sunscreen, but they're doing it for various forms of cosmetics. So he bangs he his head on the wall a few times and goes, that hurts, you know, fail a little bit, pivot, as they say in tech. Right. Any other uh, examples of, of horizontal? Oh, there's, there's, um, you know, there's millions of them. I tell the story of, you know, of, of IBM and of, um, and of uh, AT and T. But you know, I mean, you look at digital equipment, right? I mean, digital equipment yeah. um, uh, in 1987 hired, a, you know, a, a, an ocean liner docked it in the 
port of Boston or Boston Harbor, isn't that how you say it? Boston Harbor for Deck World, yeah. and they hired 10,000 plus that salesmen. Was the, that was the QE2 I was there. QE2, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Feet on the street, Ken Olson said, to, um, to, to get more salesmen to sell more digital equipment, uh, vaxes and the like, when in reality the world was going horizontal. The PCs you know, didn't offer the same performance, not yet anyway, but they had tons of feet on the street because Intel did the processor and Microsoft did the operating system and uh, Lotus and Adobe and Aldis did the applications. Compaq and Dell and others would wrap plastic around it. CompUSA would sell it. Dell was selling it by phone. I mean, you had infinite number of feet on the street or more feet on the street than DEC could ever come up with. And so I think the company, which sold to Compaq. Well, they kind of uh, went, they missed the boat on that. Yeah. What other rules do you have for us? Uh, of, the, of the 12 rules. The other one else? that I think is important is the, is, uh, the intelligence at the edge. And, and that's an old... I shouldn't say an old, but I, that's an important Been around for Silicon all the- Valley axiom, which is, you know, the intelligence is at the edge of the network. You know, the, the whole corporate world is all about command and control, right? It's, mm-hmm. you know, you report to someone who reports to someone who reports to someone. You yeah. might as well call them, instead of CEOs, you know, generals and colonels and lieutenants and uh, captains and I don't even know how they all ranks it, down to the buck privates. But in reality, because of technology, because of uh, the ability to gather information, because, you know, people at the edge can see more and they're intelligent people, they often know more than it gets filtered back up to the CEO can make decisions better and faster. And so that works in the technology world, too, is instead and you get of, mobility at the edge, you get gaming. I mean, my exactly son's on Xbox right. like crazy. Exactly. Talking to all his friends, playing games. But you'd be surprised how many, how few number of uh, uh, businesses structure themselves to take advantage of uh, intelligence yet. So that's part of it. But the other part of it is this whole Tom Sawyer effect. I mean, think about Facebook. I mean, what is Facebook? Facebook is just a giant sandbox. I mean, yeah, they'll store some photos and have a couple of neat apps that help you do things, but they don't put all the information in there. It's, you know, the Tom Sawyer sitting there telling all his friends, hey, you know, paint my fence, paint, you know, play in my sandbox. And by playing in the sandbox, then they can, you know, create this huge ecosystem. Of data, great data, out. great content, basically population of content and Yeah, data. but someone else did it. I mean, think yeah. about Google. They didn't put all those web pages up. They just found them and, and figured out how to categorize them. That's scale. That's horizontal. It's scale, it's horizontal, but it's also its intelligence at the end. So it's intelligent devices but also devices that can interface with intelligent yeah. humans. And that might mean, you know, that the interface of our iPhones is, is, is while well, it's nice and there's, you know, you can swipe your finger and stuff, maybe that's becoming obsolete over time too. Maybe it's going to be voice and, and air gestures, right? Like turn the page and, yeah, and yeah. you know, turn up the volume and, Kinetic, you know, yeah. kill the interview. And uh, <laughs> Well, we're here with Andy Kessler. I'm John Furrier at the Extraction Point today uh, at SiliconAngle.tv. Andy Kessler wrote the book Eat People. So you can't forget that name. It's got a fork going through a, a body, ties flying in the air, hats coming off, great logo, Eat People, andykessler.com. It's a great book. Um, there are a lot of folks out there in the tech business and an audience, a new generation of users, developers, and future execs in the world, and whether they do their own startup. What do you, what's your advice to folks out there? I mean, and, and for example, let's take an example, gamers, right? So you've got a, a new generation of gamers. You wrote a book, um, a story on the Wall Street Journal, uh, talked about gaming and how it could be good for, for the economy and people. It is. So the, the game, you know, a lot, a lot of gamers out there who watch us on Justin TV, for example, um, want to know what, what's going on with gaming, opportunities. So what opportunities in gaming? What does gaming mean to society? What do, what do you, how do you read those? Well, theories? let's go back. I mean, it, 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 if, if you trace the history of a lot of technology, it came out of the military, right? Because the military needed the latest and greatest, and, it, and would, uh, the government would pay exorbitant sums for, for sort of a small number of weapons or whatever else. Um, you know, GPS was a system that was, you know, originally funded because of nuclear deterrent, new debt. Um, uh, nuclear detonation, not nuclear deterrent, nuclear detonation detection that would sit in those satellites. You know, uh, great technology came out of the military. But the problem with the military, thank goodness, is that we're not always at war, and therefore they don't drive the volumes that consumers can. And, and I've noticed that, you know, the volume product that, that you know, even ahead of communications and the like, is, has been gaming. It, it's driven the graphics-intensive uh, processors uh, harder than any... Uh, commercial application and mobility. I mean, PSPs and... Um, the uptake on the uh, users has been fantastic, right? I mean, people love games. I yeah. mean, who doesn't love games? So so Toshiba, who may or may not make the displays for the iPhone, I don't know, there's a handful of companies that do that, you know, uh, or, or, or Sony, they got their expertise in doing that from the gaming world. And, and, you know, I'm fascinated by the gaming world also because, you know, 
inside World of Warcraft or Call of Duty or whatever, everything else, there are these highly visual but also highly collaborative environments that people solve interesting puzzles, you know, usually killing orcs or whatever or, 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 or <laughs> other or each transforming. other. But, you know, think about the corporate environment in the future where it's going to be highly visual and highly collaborative and it's going to use voice and gestures and yeah. everything else. Yeah. And, and we're training, I mean, I, I, people look at, often look at video games as evil and as time sinks. And I look at it as, as the next training ground, yeah. you know, not, not for the for, military, but for corporate America. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, for drone pilots. But really, it, you know, it's that problem solving. You know, you go to Wall Street and there's, you know, football field size trading floors with people with dozens of screens sitting there looking for patterns and the like. And, and they have yet to take advantage of that uh, high resolution, highly visual, highly collaborative. Multidimensional data, attention. Multidimensional, yeah issues i mean and, and so so let's and then the other thing is the connect the connect is like the coolest thing ever right because it's redefining an interface for users is is no longer do you you know i was never very good at those uh, touch pads i, I would we're shoot, keyboard i play doom with a with a mouse uh, yeah, as keyboard. opposed to the keypad but you know here it's just it's it's all visual and i think gestures yeah. and voice recognition are, are going to be the, the the next wave and here it is it's it's, it's so for, out the, here for the young entrepreneurs out there who are in the gaming field what yeah. of your rules what, which rules oh, would they you all work i mean they all work almost is there anyone one that jumps out at particular well it's the mo the, the number six that be adaptive you know let let uh don't have humans adapt to computers have computers adapt to humans that's what the connect is it doesn't say here you need to push the button x or up or a mm -hmm. or b it's hey we'll figure out what you're doing and 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 i think that and scale and, and, and so my advice to entrepreneurs is, you know, the old Nike line, just do it. You know, you got a great idea, most likely it's going to be successful. It, it matters to the execution. You have to be able to attract capital, which means make sure you have a business model and a, and a high return business. But more than likely, you're going to change the world. And so just do it. The, the, you mentioned before, you know, the, the idea of you go to college and you get a job after college at a big company because it's lower risk is bogus because those big companies they'll are lay higher off, risk. They'll They're lay you off in a heartbeat. Exactly. As opposed to working for yourself. You work for yourself, John. You know yeah, what it's like. I mean, your boss is a jerk. But other than that, yeah, it's, that's, uh, it's me. It's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's harder. It's more riskier to be out on your own. But I tell you, you know, you can at least control your own destiny. No pain, and, no gain. And, uh, and this is why the entrepreneurship boom is so hot right now, and these rules do apply, because you know, my advice to entrepreneurs is that I started late as an entrepreneur. I think I was in my 30s when I did my first company. If I had to go back and do it again, I'd do it right out of college, because even though I got a lot of great experience working for HP for nine years, I kind of came out in a, out of a cave. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, I'd much rather get knocked down on the street when I'm 23. Yeah, and more go, resilient. Yeah. Okay, that's not good. I want to, you know, do that at the young. I got to ask, you know, you know, hey, should I, should I do? I have an opportunity with the startup. Should I do it? And I said, well, why wouldn't you? Well, because if it fails, I said, well, if it fails, you're still you. You're still hireable by other yeah. some customers. Going to pay you for the expertise. In fact, you'll have more expertise because yeah. you'll have five years of of knowledge that others don't have. And so, yeah. I think you just do it. Yeah, yeah. And so, Andy Kessler, author of Eat People, also New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, game. Gaming, let's keep on the gaming theme. Xbox. Xbox. Um, great. I mean, just people love it. Mostly males like it. But, you know, for the most part, that user interface, that collaborative, the headset, multiplayer game, Connect is opening it up to a, a, a whole other gender. I mean, one of the what most should successful. Microsoft, what should Microsoft do? If so if Microsoft listens to your rules, because they have a great environment in the gaming world. Okay, you got Connect. you talked about. Right. They have mobile trying to make a, a dent. We didn't even talk about mobile. I mean, you got Android and Apple, but where the hell's Microsoft, right? So Xbox could be a nice way to bring that new generation yeah. up into phones. What do you think about that? You know, my advice is open it up more. I mean, the coolest thing about the Kinect is it, you know, it's 149 bucks. It's some, some webcams and some sensors and some yeah. microphones and stuff. And it's already been hacked. I mean, people have hacked it for, you know, their commercial use so they could wave at their mm -hmm. PC. But, you know, Microsoft, if they already haven't, should, you know, just put the specs of it out there and let third party it's not you know third party such a such a, a, a formal sounding name let the hackers and the coders and the you know the guys that uh, do hackathons and stay up all night and drinking cold uh, jolt cola and and you know uh, wear sunglasses and turn the brightness up on yeah. their monitors. I mean, those are the ones that are going to make that connect sing, not just EA or some other game company. And, and I would say that about any platform that you come up with. I mean, that's one of the successes yeah. of Android is you can get applications out faster on an Android than you can on the iPhone. And as I agree that the Android is behind 
the iPhone in terms of uh, functionality and in terms of stability. It's not quite stable yet. It still crashes uh, uh, every once in a while. The functionality is out there, but it's catching up. And yet, you can you can create it today, and it could be out on the Android tomorrow. And it's a it's that open system. And so, my advice to Microsoft, which they don't like, but they should know. I mean, they they, they the, the Windows APIs have been published for a long time, and and that's how they had their success of you know Windows being locked in. And I would do it for. Every product they ever do is the day that it comes out, release the APIs for the, for the hackers to go and rip it to shreds. I'm John Furrier with Extraction Point with Andy Kessler, author of the book Eat People, here in Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, our studio at Cloudera, the home of big data. Andy, you've been an investor. I think the stat was you raised a couple million bucks for start a hedge fund or an investment fund and grew it to a billion dollars and people throwing money at you. The book you wrote, what was the book? Not Running Money. Running Money and uh, Wall Street Meet was the first one. the book you wrote money. about the hedge fund? Yeah, Running Money. Running Money, it's a great book, you gotta get that one. Um, people come up with limos, billion dollars being thrown at you. You made some good money and then you shut it down, right, when the bubble burst. It's, it got, you know, so, frothy was one of the words, but uh, <laughs> it, got, it got out of control, yeah. So you played and made a lot of money and did the, the pre-bubble stuff now. What's your take on Silicon Valley you got Twitter, ten billion dollar rumored valuation. Core in the three four hundred million dollar valuation. Facebook at sixty billion dollar valuation. Zynga at you know nine billion. LinkedIn's going public at a, Link, a billion uh, plus and um, these crazy valuations. Um, bubble or not a bubble? Are we in a bubble? And what's your angle on all this? Uh, and you got the know. secondary markets basically selling out. Shareholders are getting liquid prior to a market. Is that a public market? <laughs> you know, you know, you get these secondary little private markets going on. What the hell? Yeah, what you know, the hell's going on out there? I don't know. Bubbles are in the eye of the beholder. The, the beholder, <laughs> and well, I was you about got to say <laughs> the eye of the deceiver, but it's the beholder. <laughs> and and uh, you know, bubbles can last for a long time. But I will say the the because of Sarbanes Oxley uh, rules and other SEC rules, I think you know they're, they're, it's expensive to go public, so less companies are going. You know. Facebook is trying to put it off as long as they can. And so uh, there has developed these private markets. And you know, the, the nice thing about the stock market, everyone beats up on the stock market, but the stock market is all about price discovery. There's a lot of sellers and there's a lot of buyers and they match in the middle. And every day, you know, they discover what price the profit stream from some company is worth. Because, and it only works because there's millions of people plugged into that stock market with the free will to buy and sell every day. In the bubble, of 99 and 2000, it wasn't an, a free market. You know, IPOs had lockups and there was problems with NASDAQ trading. You know, there's all sorts of things that I think helped inflate the bubble. This time, it's not even in the public markets. It's these private exchanges where there's a very limited number of sellers yeah. and there's a lot of venture capitalists who missed investing in Facebook who are clamoring for shares. And so, limited number of sellers and, so those other and hungry companies, buyers. Zynga and Twitter was invested by in VCs that weren't even located in California. Yeah, well, actually, so it's Russian uh, uh, yeah. who's done who have done quite well because Boston the private and New, market Boston valuation and New, has gone Boston up. and New York VCs actually invested in some of those so companies. So you can tell me that Facebook is worth fifty-two uh, billion, or that Twitter and um, uh, Zynga are worth eight billion, and I say, okay, uh, you, you can pick whatever number you want. It's it's where those buyers and sellers match. But unless there's a large number of buyers and sellers, I don't believe the numbers. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's less than that. And it's not until you get the public market valuations. By the way, even public, when you go public, the first six months, not all the shares are freely tradable. And so, you know, I, I would say buyer beware. Yeah, <laughs> Be yeah, very yeah. careful. Yeah, and yeah. that's true because it's leaked over into the public markets. Uh, what I found and what our investment fund did 10, 12 years ago is when money's being thrown at these service companies, you know, back then, uh, we talked about it, it was eatmyshorts.com, you, you bought shares in the infrastructure companies, those that were selling the, the tools and the network equipment and the hard drives and all that kind of stuff. And you know, you're seeing values of those, a lot of these things are being taken a legit, out of A legit values because they actually are making money. Well, they've got terrific business because the money that um, is going into these uh, new startups is flowing into, flowing into the equipment companies and the infrastructure companies. So that's a, uh, uh, call it a, a little more. Uh, what would you be doing if you were running a fund right now? I mean, would you be doing early stage deals? Would you be running for the hills? Would you actually, if you were, if you were doing it, what would you be doing? Now you know why I retired from the investment <laughs> business because uh, running other people's money is fraught with daily questions of you know what the hell is this thing worth and why and who's doing what to who and what's the competitive analysis and the like. I think it's all teed off of what's going on at the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve has 
short-term interest rates effectively at zero. It's ZERP, zero interest rate policy. And all the models of valuation are driven off of short-term rates, right? So if short-term rates are 4% and they go to 5%, then valuations go down. If they go to 3%, then valuations go up because the alternatives to investing just in you know, low-risk bonds is better or worse. When interest rates are zero, it tells you that every company is worth infinite. You just put an infinite valuation because you know, it's, you're divide by zero uh, uh, on these models. Um, interest rates will not be zero forever. Interest rates will back up to 1%, 2%, whatever the number might be as the economy picks up, as jobs are being created. I won't want to be holding the hot potato when interest yeah. rates back up. Are they going to back up tomorrow? No. Yeah. Next day, maybe. Uh, six months from now? So do you think it's fair likely. that these, these uh, big companies can sell the, these, their shares in these secondary markets? when their investors aren't able to sell them. There's been some talk about some Silicon Valley companies where the founders can sell, but the VCs can't. I mean, it's kind of a mismatch. I mean, I'm kind of pro-founder, obviously, but um, that's good. I mean, the founder can get some cash. I mean, well, um, it, it turns out there are both, there, you know, there's both shares being sold to fund the companies. Mm -hmm. There are shares being sold by the founders. And in some cases, there's shares being sold by the early venture capitalists. A lot of the money that went to um, the, the Russian investment fund were both founders and VCs of Facebook and in, in is he Is so. he a sucker or what? I don't know. I mean, you know, if he invests He comes in, in uh, I want to buy your stock. Facebook and I at a $10 billion valuation. And he's now a genius. It's uh, $50 billion. It's, It looks pretty smart. On the other hand, it, maybe he's the one driving the price up from $10 billion to $50 billion and, and the, the We don't the, know the lockups. There's all this public information that's not available. The future profit stream of Facebook may be considerable. I think they have a lot of work to do in, in developing a business model. If you look at what makes Google successful, we talked about it before, is if you're buying a plasma TV, you go to Google and type in plasma TV and advertisers will pay a, a market price to uh, get you to click on their ad, you know, so that they are the ones selling you a plasma TV. It's usually not Best Buy, it's two guys in Brooklyn who are selling it out of a warehouse in the back. And, you know, who cares who you buy it from? It's that nice yeah. plasma TV. But Google has made a business of capturing a lot of the gross margin of those sales. Has Facebook done that or Twitter done that or others? You know, Groupon has a funky model that may be emulating that, but those others, not really. The, they, uh, Facebook and then, of course, Zynga have created a model of uh, selling virtual goods, right? Give me a dollar and I'll, you can yeah. send a balloon to a friend, a digital balloon. You go, whoa, that's pretty cool because <laughs> you sold for a dollar something that cost you absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, uh, uh, is that a big enough business? Uh, it might be. It might I be a lifestyle pretty cool. business. If you look at the gamer world we were talking about before, the ability to buy uh, um, you know, virtual goods and virtual services in these online worlds, it's a multi-billion dollar business. Is it a hundred billion dollar business? I don't know. It's a, lot, it's so. a lot of multi-billion dollar, million dollar businesses. Eventually, you got to wear clothes and eat food and you know, watch ESPN and stuff like that. But uh, so what's so we're at Andy Kessler who wrote the book Eat People, um, seen the multiple cycles, entrepreneur himself now as a writer, um, publisher, Wall Street Journal analyst, investor. What's changed ten years ago? You mentioned how the Wall Street's changed. What's changed for entrepreneurs? I mean, because you were just kind of referring to these gaming environments where you know there's a lifestyle business. Your cost to start a company are X, and you're making X plus significant amounts, but not enough to go public or right. be sold. I mean, you know, an entrepreneur can literally pull down one to two million dollars in cash a year over five years. That's ten million dollars. That's a nice payout versus working for a startup, being locked up and maybe pulling out ten million over five years, maybe. Right. So. So you have that kind of dynamic. So the good news is it's easier today to be an entrepreneur because the capital available and the tools are available, right? The platforms, you don't have to rewrite a lot of code. It's already there. Uh, the equipment is so cheap, you know, uh, the, both the PCs and laptops and tablets and all that kind cloud, of stuff. You get cloud, you get cloud, all that stuff. The cloud, right. You can rent it from Amazon or rent it from a bunch of different places. That's the good news. The bad news is it's cheap for everybody. So anytime there's some new market segment, there's... Groupon, you know, like dozen, Groupon. Groupon, Living Social, you know, uh, eatmycoupons.com. It's like 10 com, zillion this. clones of Groupon right now. Right, and, and photo manipulation sites and, mm -hmm. and location-based yeah. services. So how do you stand out? Well, you better be quick. Rules. You better be first. Yeah. You, know, you better take advantage of the rules. Make sure it scales. <laughs> it's horizontal intelligence at the edge. Adaptive. Ah. <laughs> what about this startup craze about uh, incubators? Um, y Combinator recently, there's an entrepreneur star out there, class of 40. I called it the community college of startups. Yeah. You know, they're all kind of hanging out in this little school class. And the Russian guy, Yuri, comes in and drops in, you know, 150K. Can nice. Hey, happy birthday. Nice. You know, 
What do you make of all that? I mean, good, bad, hey, great. Uh, are the VCs getting kind of squeezed I, out? Is it a hedge fund? I mean, just a portfolio approach, just take all the startups. I've seen, I've seen incubators come and go in the past, and I think incubators will come and go in the future. Uh, the reality of the venture capital business is it's a portfolio theory. You know, if you have one company that gives you a 50x return, it makes up for nine others that give you zeros. And you still make 5x on your fund or 4x on your fund. Um, Incubators are doing that in a much wider way. It's the shotgun approach. You know, you see some of these angels or super angels. Who came up with the name super angels? I think it was the angels themselves who yeah. called themselves super angels. No, the uh, new angels that weren't so super called themselves super angels. Yes. But, but because of the bad press, they're now called micro VCs. Micro VCs. That's the new word. Micro VC is Maybe the hot word. Maybe they're nano VCs and don't really <laughs> know it. And that's the thing with, <laughs> with incubators. It's, it's the shotgun approach, right? Shotguns have hundreds of pellets that scatter out. Maybe it'll hit a target. Maybe it won't. Um, I haven't seen too much success, but it's early because there's, you know, it, these things can take two, three, five years to, may I use the term, incubate before they're ready to hatch. Yeah. But, you know, is that model um, good for entrepreneurs? Absolutely, because well, I mean, there's I bring capital the, available to do it. Will it dry up? Of course it's going to dry up. There's going to be a lot of dead bodies. I mean, certainly, I mean, it's going to be a lot of Venture carnage. funds come and go. There were too many venture funds in the 90s. Those that couldn't raise funds eventually went out of business. I think there's still too many venture funds. But it's a good, good market for an entrepreneur. There's a lot of cash available. It's at the, the earliest. best time to be an entrepreneur. But don't get over stuffed with yourself when someone says, you know, I'll give you $2 million for 10% of your company and says, oh, I have a $20 million value in your company. No, you don't. I mean, you do, yeah. but you really don't because you can't yeah, eat yeah. the $20 million valuation. And then, God forbid, you run out of that $2 million and you need yeah. to raise $2 more. million more. And someone says, well, it's not a $20 million and it's not even a $10 million. It's going to be at $5 million. You got to give up half your company because you raised money at yeah. too high of a value. So yeah, yeah. Uh, th there, there's, there's so the many same traps, Same traps, as always. Just got to be careful of not to drinking your own Kool-Aid, what you're, what you're basically saying. Don't get overhyped. What about the um, what about the angel investors, the real old angels, the, the traditional angels, ones that were you know, supposed to be helping companies? Sure. I mean, they're kind of backseat now. I mean, to well, these super angels, I, um, these micro angels. Are there nano angels? <laughs> That's a new word. Or we're, pico <laughs> angels? I, you know, look, everyone has the dream of, you know, taking 25 grand out of their uh, IRA and, and throwing into the next hot startup. And, um, you know, I think there were a lot of very successful entrepreneurs at Google who have cashed out and says, okay, I now have X million dollars and I'm going to give back by investing in a bunch of startups. And what I like about that is here's a guy with experience or, or woman with experience who's going and helping entrepreneurs grow their company. Um, the thing about the venture capital business is, is it's, it's an asset class. It's, it's, you know, pension funds and endowments and the like say, okay, I'm going to take 5% or 10% of, you know, the Harvard endowment uh, um, and I'm going to invest it in, you know, these illiquid names, but that can grow wealth in a big way over decades. Yeah. I like that. When, when angels come in, it kind of when they try to do the, the math on the, these yeah. big endowments and pension funds, because now there's too much money chasing the same number of entrepreneurs, or worse, too many entrepreneurs enter and you get 50 companies doing um, uh, social coupons, yeah. and so now maybe there's no returns in that business. Um, so basically, what you're first, saying is, is, is so that basically the, the the profile is someone with domain expertise has some cash, wants to help out, not so much a portfolio approach. Yeah, a few, but really focused on domain expertise, and then the math on the asset class, and then the those are conflicting. Those are those are the endpoints, and then the middle is where the kind of garbage is. The right? middle is, you know, the, you know, what they say: a fool and his money will <laughs> soon be parted. Or <laughs> a, a sucker's born every minute. On the other hand, there are success stories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, people who get out of the middle quickly move to the left. Yes. You know, to the asset class. I think that's what they're all trying to do. Um, we're here with Andy Kessler, the author of Eat People. I'm John Furrier on the new show, Extraction Point. Um, Andy, we'll and end off the, uh, the show today with some philosophy. Um, you know, we follow your column on the New York Times once in a while, but mostly in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which we're, we're fans of. We like the journal. Um, you write a lot about the the FCC, and you write about you know net neutrality. You have a good view about technology and how that applies to society. You've written some great books about industrial revolution and you know modern day stuff we just talked about. What's your view for the future, and what what do we have to do as a country, America, to compete in this global economy? Yeah. Um, and 
just be kind of high level. And for there's a lot of young folks out there kind of scratching their head who, quite frankly, you know, weren't around when, you know, there was a three and a half inch floppy. I mean, they weren't around. I, mean, I was talking to an entrepreneur, he's like, three and a half inch floppy. I'm like, well, he goes, you're old. I'm like, that's, that, that's not that old. What's it like? I mean, there are issues. Technology policy. Yes. Economic policy. Yeah. All this is kind of converging together. Just let's end off on kind of a vision of how you think so, it so should go for the, let's the, start with this there are smart people everywhere there, there are, you know this country america has the united states of america has the benefit of having the structure the rule of law somewhat sound currency uh in place so that we attract smart people from around the world to come here and to implement their productive vision okay um, we have a great education system. I'm worried that it's too expensive, but um, yeah. nonetheless, uh, it higher attracts, education. Higher education. It attracts the smartest people from around the world to come here. Um, some people complain, well, then they just go home, and you go, no, no, that's fine, because then that's the networking, that's the communication link that mm -hmm. entrepreneurs in the U.S. will work with entrepreneurs or old classmates in other countries. I think uh, the best thing that that the U.S. can do, policymakers can do, is get the hell out of the way. There are too many rules and too many regulations and too much, you know, futzing around with uh, network neutrality, which is, you know, a yeah, buzzword yeah. for overregulation. when in reality competition solves all sorts of, you know, competition makes networks neutral. Because if they're not too neutral, you just go to a competitor that is neutral. If neutrality is what yeah. you want. If you want your Netflix movies to, to stream glitch-free, you pay $5 more a month. I mean, that's how it should be. But as long as I have a choice, I don't want to just pay Comcast $5 more a month because they're my only broadband provider. I want to pay them because the next guy uh, doesn't offer that service. So forget about network neutrality. It's, it's, it's an industry buzzword for let's regulate the crap out of the Internet. And we know we don't want that. So get out of the way same thing with tax policy is you know we keep changing the the capital gains rate just you were talking about a free market system free market society a laissez-faire yeah. isn't that uh, remarkable because <laughs> yeah. that's what's worked in fact the vent you could you can you can note the genesis of the um the venture capital business to a cut in the capital gains rate where those pensions and endowments would start saying okay i can start doing of course pensions and endowments often don't pay taxes but you know wealthy individuals would say i can i can do decades long investing and my returns won't be taxed as if they're ordinary income and so get out of the way there are smart people they're doing great things unfortunately when you talk about communications technology uh interferes or overlaps with the regulated world you know uh, cable is regulated wireless is regulated telephone system is regulated you know the internet whether we like it or not the, that transportation portion of it is regulated but you can start putting uh, and, and anything involved uh, with spectrum is regular. I think you should let Spectrum go free. Just what about education? What about um, not higher education? Because we do have the best institutions. But, you know, there's been a lot of controversy that the big American experiment of, of education really hasn't worked. Well, I don't know. I look decades. at high school curriculum. It's all about memorization of, you know, usually worthless things. I mean, um, and, 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 you know, they make you take uh, French or Spanish when I'd rather learn a different language like Java. Right, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a useful language, like a programming language, and it's the same thing. You know, we spend so much time on um, teaching algebra and trigonometry and calculus, where you know, yeah, if you want to be a physicist or you want to, you know, design yeah. suspension bridges, that's what you ought to be doing. But I think you know, w we don't teach enough about newer curriculum, like how the web works and how parallel systems work and how, you know, uh, networks can be leveraged and the statistics of, uh, of, 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 of using these networks. And so is that going to be overhauled? You know, forget it. It's not going to happen. The, the, the students who want to do that figure it out and then um, they go use to, the Internet. They use the Internet. They use it or they go to institutions of higher learning where they can get that expertise. And so, you know, I don't I wouldn't. It's the same argument as net neutrality. They need choice. They need choice. Competition would be nice. And, you know, so, so institutions, you know, uh, colleges and universities do compete. I, I worry about, you know, that we're still turning out too many French lit majors because there aren't French lit jobs. On the other hand, there are a lot of computer science yeah. jobs and networking jobs. And, and, and I think there's a need for really smart people, which, again, are everywhere. They're not just in the U.S., but they're attracted yeah. to the U.S. because of our... our, our the rule of law and sound currency and uh, and the ease of starting a corporation here and and 
policymakers need to get out of the way to keep it like that. We're here with Andy Kessler. The, the book uh, Eat People is his new book, uh, author. Um, great to have you on the new show, Extraction Point. Great, great philosophy about that. Um, I just want to go back and ask one final question because you brought that up. I think you mentioned the railroads in your book. Are we at a railroad stage right now on the Internet? I mean, are we laying down a new modern secondary set of railroads? Can you talk about everything you talked about, the free market, education. I mean, a lot of this stuff needs to be rehauled. Or there's new new vehicles. Yeah. yeah. I mean, any parallel between railroad? You talk about steam engine in one book, and then railroad. What's are we in a railroad? In society. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Digital yeah. railroad. So, so think about it. The, the great line about uh, railroad companies is that they 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 at the end of the day thought they were in the railroad business, but we really were in the transportation business, right? So they never could get off those rails when trucking started destroying uh, the railroad business, and and. Um, and, and cars started taking passengers away or, or short-haul uh, flights. They're in the transportation business. And so you wonder sometimes about a lot of companies in the tech business in Silicon Valley, what business they're really in. I mean, you know, Comcast is in the broadband business. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're in an information delivery business, and it, and it better work uh, over the pipes that they own and maybe over pipes that they don't own. I mean, you see ESPN is trying to go wide and, and not just sell over cable, but sell over the Internet. Uh, Google is, you know, they, they like to say they're in a million different things, but, you know, they're in, the, they're in the ad business. They're not even in the search business. They're in the advertising business. And um, <clears throat> I, I suspect that they know that because that's 90-plus percent of the revenue. revenue that they generate. Um, but, you know, they're a media company, and, and um, Facebook, whether they like it or not, is a new form of a media company. Apple, by charging subscription rates on iPad magazines, if that's what you want to call them, yeah. is, is in the media business. And the rules for the media business are completely different from the old technology business of, you know, you come out Speeds with a microprocessor. And and two, yeah. Speeds and feeds. This port gets density, port density. Almost. Perfect. That's yeah. a perfect way of looking at yeah. it. And we had a new port this month. Yeah, yeah, rah, rah. It's different. So, right. So, do you, does you know Google come out and say, we now have the 5 gigahertz Google versus the 4.6 gigahertz Google last year? No. They have to constantly improve uh, the quality of the media that they're creating. And, and uh, you know, I've studied the media business. And I've watched media companies you know, come and go, and, and, you know, there's a lot of them left to be destroyed, and it's yeah. it's going on as we speak. I mean, yeah. uh, look at um, Newsweek merging with the Daily Beast, right? And you go, what? I mean, that's almost like digital equipment being bought by Compaq. You go, yeah. you know, what the hell is going on What the here? hell happened? Well, Silicon Angle, you know, merging with AOL. There we go. You know? <laughs> I think that's more likely yeah. than, uh, <laughs> than anything that we've talked about. So, so um, you got, you know, like the railroads, is your question is, you know, forgot that they were in the transportation business. I think, you know, the, these technology-intensive companies. You know, you go to Facebook and they say, we're an engineering company. You go, okay, but you're engineering what? You're engineering a new form of, of media. So you better study the media rules, and it's about uh, uh, transactions, and it's about... Uh, data. You know, it's about data, but Profiling. it's also about human psyche and getting them to, you know, pay five cents more for their soap. I mean, t television, they call it soap operas for a reason. It's, it's, it's not about, you know, football is not about uh, Tom Brady. It's about selling Budweiser and Gillette, you know, five-blade razors. And, and the NFL knows that. And um, the media companies so the big, know that. The big trend right now is cl in cloud computing is big data. Big data. And big data. What does that mean, big data? Well, I, I, <laughs> is there small Someone's data? Someone's got a big data, you know? They got big data. They put it on the table. So, you know, the, you know, big data, little data, fast data. But, I mean, data has a competitive advantage. I mean, companies like... That's what you do with it, right? Yeah. I mean, because you can... You can look, I can, you in the I, old days, you had a credit card companies, these big data warehouses sitting on big servers. Yes. And now you've got open source like Hadoop here at Cloudera. You can store and oh. start cataloging data, you know, And access data. it out on the edge, where yeah. before it was these, you know, write-only databases. I think, I think the coolest thing about um, big data is that you and I can go next door to Fry's and buy a terabyte drive for $59. A terabyte drive. Two terabyte drives is a hundred bucks. Well, what can you store in that? All sorts of things. And yeah. Yeah. you know, and 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 if you put it out in the cloud and aggregate them, you can you can have tons or a big data set. Now, what do you do with it? Well, there's all sorts of business intelligence to be had of harnessing that data. And I think we've got a decade worth of spaghetti against the wall, having companies have a competitive advantage by leveraging that data. Unfortunately. 
when everyone else can do it, that competitive advantage is going to be short-lived, and you got to move on yeah. to the next competitive advantage. That's yeah. the risk to big yeah. data. I think big data is about fast data and uh, you know useful data, not slow and yes. not you know not used. All right, we're here with Andy Kessler. That's a wrap. This is uh, your extraction point. I'm John Furrier, SiliconAngle.tv. Andy, thanks for coming on our third show. Appreciate it. I just have one final thing to say, which <laughs> is extraction point with John Furrier. That's a wrap.